this really is going to be a crash course. Like one of the one of the interesting things I think about this conference is we have people from psychology, neuroscience, philosophy, engineering, computer science. And so now we have five speakers who are going to give you uh, brief flash talks, uh, you know, zooming in from around the world, you know, um, Canada, Edinburgh, uh, UNC, um, and, uh, University of Kent. So we have a lot of, a lot of uh, different expertise as well. So I'm really excited for this next hour or so uh, before lunch, um, where we'll have coffee, I promise, um, to hear from each of these five distinguished guests. And so let me double check what the order of that was supposed to be. Um, but for those of you, who, for those speakers, if you should be able to simply share screen from your computer. Hey, I have a, I have a conference program right here. I'll just look at that. Okay. So we have five speakers. So we have Jim uh, Everett from the Univers University of Kent, Department of Psychology. We have Angelica Lim from Simon Fraser University, who works in computer science. Uh, Agnieszka Wykowska from the uh, Italian Institute of Technology, who does a lot of fascinating work with human-robot interactions. Danica Dillian from UNC Chapel Hill, who's looked at um, how LLMs and AI can work in moral psychology experiments. And then finally, uh, Aaliyah Deck from the University of Edinburgh, who's done some great work on the moral psychology of humans and AI. So we'll go in that order, uh, about five or six minutes for each, or six to seven minutes for each, and then make sure to keep dropping your questions in the Q&A, and we'll try to save like time for maybe one or two questions per presentation. So, all right. Um, so Jim, whenever you're ready, please feel free to share screen. Um, so let's go. So uh, hi everyone, and um, thanks so much for uh, for listening to me here today. Thank you so much, Daryl, for organizing this. And I'm, it's such a shame that I can't be there in person, but thanks for hosting us uh, remotely. So I'm going to talk today about some work that I've been doing um, with my fantastic postdoc Simon Myers about whether people think an intelligent machine is a moral machine. We're examining here the psychology of the orthogonality thesis and understanding how people are thinking about these AIs as we talk about empathic AI. So AI is developing rapidly and it's being used, as we know, in numerous and incre increasingly consequential domains. Um, so we've often said that arti artificial agents are artificially intelligent because they're expected to uh, exhibit, uh, perform behaviors or exhibit characteristics or processes that demonstrate intelligence to humans. But increasingly, they're also being required to exhibit artificial morality by making decisions or helping us in cases that if, dis if performed by human would be described as moral. Now, the promise of any new technology comes with uh, concerns about safety, but this becomes even more acute given the rate of innovation and the applications of AI. I would be here maybe more of the, uh, the tech doomsayer. Um, so I'm not primarily a philosophy, though I, I do experiment in philosophy. I'm mostly a psychologist. And one of the things I'm most interested in this space is trust or how we think about agents, both human and artificial. So we know um, that we rapidly infer the traits that other people have. We build this picture of them based on sparse information. And this is important because it helps us in humans with partner choice and cooperation. We form these impressions across key dimensions of competence or intelligence, um, about warmth and about morality. So what Simon and I have been interested in is how we form impressions and how we trust non-human agents like AI. And in particular for uh, the talk here, what's the connection between perceptions of intelligence and perceptions of morality? So one normative concern for AI safety theorists is that there's no guarantee that increased intelligence or instrumental rationality would lead to increased morality or moral alignment or empathy. And in fact, some have argued that they're actually completely orthogonal to each other. So the orthogonality thesis is suggesting that there's no guarantee that as an AI agent becomes more intelligent, it becomes more moral. And there's therefore no guarantee that it becomes less dangerous. But increased intelligence does not mean that it has increased moral concern or moral alignment with our values. So there's a lot of um, uh, philosophical, theoretical debate about the orthogonality thesis. But some of the concerns about orthogonality follow on from certain claims about human psychology. 
if people view intelligence and morality as being positively correlated, then popular narratives that we're seeing about AI progress could actually be leading to undue optimism and potentially leading us to infer that AI has our best interests at heart, when of course it doesn't. But in fact, we actually know relatively little about how people perceive this relationship in AI, but also arguably in humans. So in this work, um, we're examining how people perceive the relationship between morality and intelligence. So this is very in-progress work, but so far we've conducted seven pre-registered studies um, looking at both AI in studies one to three and comparing AI to humans in study four to seven. We're examining the relationship between perceptions of intelligence and morality, and we're looking at the effects that this has on trust and perceptions of safety. So we're using different experimental paradigms here. So we're using between subjects descriptions where we're presenting more akin to popular science pieces about the promise of AI and the developments of AI. We're doing some within subjects augmentation studies. So we present participants with a description of AI and then we say there's been this uh, advance in machine learning or there's been this other change. Um, and this uh, agent has become much more intelligent and we've been asking direct questions on expected change. So we've been saying an AI has changed in intelligence. It has become rapidly more intelligent. How does this affect its morality? How does this affect its moral concern? And what we're finding across all these studies is that people are resistant to orthogonality. So our results support the psychological concerns raised by AI safety proponents because people perceive intelligence and morality as reliably correlated. So people are assuming that a highly intelligent agent would also be highly moral, and they assume that artificially raised intelligence would also lead to raised morality. We see this across a number of studies using these different paradigms. We actually see that this generalizes across both humans and AI, suggesting it's more of a feature of human cognition rather than something specific to AI. And we find that um, increasing intelligence increases trust, even without increasing moral motivation. So if, some, if you say that an AI has increased intelligence, people will trust it more, um, even though that doesn't lead to greater alignment with our values. And um, we've shown, uh, we, we then started to think about how we can actually distinguish different moral features. So we can sort of distinguish perhaps broadly between moral competence, which might uh, have the factors of AI, uh, the ability of understanding moral norms or predicting outcomes or communicating or giving reasons in generative large language models from moral motivation. So this might be things like harm avoidance, the beneficence, fairness, more empathic sort of concerns. And, and perhaps what this is, is that uh, people are thinking about moral competence when they're thinking about morality and intelligence. So they're not really thinking that AI might have moral motivation. They're just thinking that AI, as it becomes more intelligent, could understand moral norms without necessarily having that critical motivation, that empathic need or desire to help others. But we actually show that while this, the effect of intelligence is stronger on moral competence, when intelligence increases, people still perceive an increase in moral, moral motivation. So our results aren't due to morality just being about competence, knowledge or moral skill, but about moral motivation too. Um, and in fact, we see that when uh, participants expect uh, greater change in moral motivation from increased intelligence when we're asking directly about how much this is going to change. Moral motivation, but not moral competence, is what reduces dangerousness or perceived dangerousness in AI. And so in conclusion, um, we're finding that people are resistant to uh, orthogonality because they're expecting that higher intelligence means high morality. This isn't just due to moral competence, knowledge or skill. And this is very concerning from a safety perspective because narratives about rapidly increasing AI progress could mistakenly lead us to expect that these machines are also going to be more moral. And there's no, uh, there's no guarantee that that's the case. So with that, I'm out of time. And um, thank you so much for my funders at the moment. And most importantly, thank you to my fantastic uh, postdoc, Simon Myers, for leading on this work. Um, thanks, everyone. time for uh, perhaps one quick question from either here or online. Uh, 
just have really simple question for Jim. Um, in uh, I know people's late theories are that uh, morality and intelligence seem to go hand in hand, but what about an actuality? <laughs> <laughs> so is there the case that, I mean, I, I, I suspect they're orthogonal, but, I, but we, we, we actually have, we could have evidence for this. So is there any, they're ortho orthogonal or dependent? Is there in humans or in, in AI? Humans, in humans. Um, I'm not actually sure if there is, um, I'm, I'm not sure how much evidence there is. I imagine that there's somewhat of a link where there's a required level of uh, baseline intelligence or sort of uh, capacity for some moral motivation. Um, but I, I don't actually know how much evidence there is for them really overlapping um, in practice, even if pe people expect that they overlap to a degree. All right, great. Well, fascinating work, Jim. Um, we, should we should move to our next speaker, uh, Angelica Lim, who will talk to us about her work in empathy, in which uh, Jana alluded to in her presentation. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's it's a shame I couldn't share sound because I actually wanted to start out my talk by playing a bit of music. So I'll just sing maybe. <laughs> um, well, I thought because we were at a conference about empathy and emotion, sometimes experiencing music and really feeling it is only the, the, the best way to convey what we're talking about than just talking about it. Um, and music and the question of whether uh, music and being moved by music is something only humans can experience uh, and not robots um, is a relevant question to the topic of um, artificial empathy, which is what I, I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so I lead a lab here in Canada called the Rosie Lab. Um, and you know, robots with social intelligence and empathy is a Sounds like a bombastic name, it's aspirational. Um, but I chose this name because I think that trying to build robots with social intelligence without empathy could be worrisome. I've worked at the intersection of emotions and robotics for about 15 years now, um, during my grad studies for about six years in Kyoto in Japan, and then about four years at SoftBank Robotics leading the emotion team on the Pepper humanoid. Um, origin story and this will be relevant, I promise, is that I started out in grad school working on a robot that was meant to play music with humans. And so we had this paper at this um, international robotics conference, but I was challenged at the time with um, something that you might be questioning, which is whether a robot could ever play real music. And would we ever want, would we ever have a robot that could really feel the music that it's playing? And if we couldn't, then was this music fake or inauthentic, which is a word I've been hearing uh, throughout today's talks, uh, or pointless? And so years later, after delving deep into the questions of emotions, I wrote a paper called A Recipe for Empathy, and it starts out with a story like this. Here we have Linda. Linda has just flown across the country to be with her mother, who's very sick. It could be her last moments. She longs to be there with her mother, mother hold her hand what could be, uh, for what could be perhaps the last time. But a robot nurse stands in her way and says, well, you've just missed a deadline. It is now 9.01 and no visitors are allowed. And I think this is what is really what people are scared of with AI and what they've historically been scared of with this concept of robot overlords. Um, you know, this extremely smart, extremely uh, emotionally intelligent, potentially, uh, uh, artifacts, but yet do not have the capacity for uh, emotional or affective empathy. Uh, that is, that this image would do absolutely nothing for them. Um, I gave a, there is a TEDx talk, uh, a new, which you're feel free to watch, which is a full version of this, but part of it talks about authenticity and this is a definition, well, part of a definition from Merriam-Webster for authenticity, which suggests that for uh, something to be authentic, we need to not only reproduce the essential features, like uh, you know the uh, aspects of this castle uh, at Disneyland, but what makes this inauthentic still is that maybe it also needs to be made in the same way as the originals. Uh, so I spent some time looking at the neuroscience, the psychology, and developmental science um, to understand how potentially this could be uh, developed or uh, represented um, in us. And so what I found at the time um, is that there are 
are some very essential features for emotional empathy. And there's a lot here, um, including the mirror system, as Jana talked about earlier, the very important insular cortex, which uh, in some sense is able to represent both physical and emotional um, feelings. And at the time, I was providing a definition um, specifically for what I thought um, robot feelings could be. So I looked at humans. I looked at how the neuroscientist uh, Antonio Damasio defined feelings as the expression of human flourishing or human distress as they occur in the mind and body. And if you think about it, um, when we come out of the room, we essentially have two states. We're crying or not crying, right? We have this distress state. We don't know what's the cause of it, but uh, there's a distress signal um, which indicates that something is uh, that they're co cold or hungry or wet or thirsty, um, right? Something is wrong. Or there's homeostasis, which is flourishing. And so I asked myself whether I could define feelings for a robot, and my analogy is as, as follows. So if we consider a flourishing feeling to have no physical problems and distress to be um, with uh, some sort of physical issue, we could define at least a physical type of feeling uh, for a robot. And the rest of the paper goes on to uh, how we could define a link between these physical feelings and emotional feelings we might build through interaction with caregivers. So in this paper, we've actually recruited a whole bunch of mock caregivers to interact with our robot using infant-directed speech um, in a way to see if we can make this link um, between expressions of emotion and the, the feeling. And so the output could uh, perhaps be a robot that could quote unquote feel, or at least let's just talk about what that might look like. Um, I just I put these uh, slides together recently, so I'd like to get your opinion on it. So what would you think if this robot, instead of saying, um, you know, you can't go in, it's 901, um, it said uh, something like, ah, oh, this feels like when my gears are rusted, you know, is, is that more authentic? Or maybe we don't care. Maybe it's enough to say this appears to be a very distressing situation. Or Maybe it doesn't matter saying anything about that and just, oh, let me check with my matter. I'm just trying to improve the situation as a result of either trying to reduce this feeling of physical or emotional pain, um, or it is simply programmed. So um, I again, the sound doesn't work here, but I'll finish off with a short example of things we're working on now in my lab. Um, I've been working on this problem of visual emotion estimation for many, many years, and we're finally having some good success with some of the recent foundation models. So here's an example of how we might be able to at least infer the emotion of a person um, in uh, thinking especially about context. So I'll read this out because um, so we have, you'll see some narrative captions. They're not very good, but what I'm, I'd like you to focus on are, are quote unquote emotion recognition or um, apparent emotion recognition amongst 26 labels. So saying, I think I see a girl who is right about a board in teacher lounge, da, 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 da. looks like she's feeling engagement. I will not bother her, right? So maybe this is something that we want from this emotionally intelligent um, robot. I think I see a woman who's listening with headphones, writing notes, looks like she's feeling engagement. I will not bother her. Um, I think I see a girl who's sleeping. In this case, it made a mistake. High school cafeteria falling asleep in odd places at odd times. Looks like she's feeling fatigue. Maybe I will try to make her feel better. And so we have some good results against the baselines. I think I see a woman who's robot dancing, fist pumping. It looks like she's feeling engagement and happiness. I will wait a bit to remind her about the deadline. Um, this is a bit tongue in cheek, um, but this is some of the ongoing work we're doing. Um, I think I've run out of time, so I'll just say, oops, thank you. And I'm very open to collaborations and feel free to contact me anytime. Thank you. Again, we might have time for one quick question, either from here in person or online. Yes. Just quickly, if we're, if, uh, can we assume that this whole effort is progressing at an exponential rate? So the question from the audience is that can we assume that this whole effort is progressing at an exponential rate? I don't think there are any very many others like myself who's working on the feeling. Uh, or, okay, it's it's a good question. So is the whole effort empathic AI? I've only heard of a, a few um, 
other folks in industry working on, on that. Um, in the research field, we do have a conference called Effective Computing and Intelligent Interaction, and there is a body of researchers working on the things that I do. However, we're also very aware that in the EU, it is now banned. Emotion recognition is banned in the workplace and in educational institutions, which I think is a, a good thing. You know, we should be very careful about how we deploy these. Um, I think it's great that we have a legislation looking and scrutinizing the work that we do. So um, I don't I don't know about the exponential rate for emotions. It certainly is for just the general AI um, field and lots of investment going in there. Um, but I don't think em emotions or empathy is being looked at nearly as much as all the other um, aspects of AI today. Great. We probably should move on to the next speaker, but definitely any other questions you have, please uh, save and we'll return to you with a discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so next, let's turn to Agnieszka Wajkowska. So whenever you're ready. Yeah, <clears throat> hello, thank you very much. I'll try to share my screen. Here it goes. Okay. Can you see my screen well, my uh, slides? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so hello everyone. I'm um, here in uh, Italy uh, at the Italian Institute of Technology. And I work with um, humanoid robot ICAP that has been developed and designed here at our institute. And um, yeah, my background is cognitive neuroscience, so I'm not a roboticist, but I work a lot with roboticists. And what I'm interested in is all sorts of questions from cognitive neuroscience uh, perspective. So well, it's, let's say intentional stance and morality are only one um, theme among many others. So first, maybe I wanted just to tell you that um, what we do in our lab is we use this kind of methods where we basically translate paradigms protocols from experimental psychology into more naturalistic human robot interaction. But we still use a lot of cognitive neuroscience methods. So as you see here, as the person is interacting with the robot, we are measuring her EEG, her neural activity with the EEG cap. We look at her eye movements and we also measure her performance with reaction times and error rates. So these are the kind of like, this is the approach that we take in um, trying to understand the human cognition and the cognitive mechanisms in human robot interaction. Now, the topics are many, as I say, uh, that we that we address in, in our team. And uh, we're uh, interested very much. One of the main topics of, of our uh, team is the intentional stance uh, question and uh, value aware AI, is something that we only recently has, have started um, working on in the context of a European project. But we also uh, work on things like social um, signals and joint attention and how people um, orient their attention in response to the robot gaze. We are very much interested in the question of sense of agency and also things like coordination and joint action tasks or cognitive control. So as you see, this is like kind of like a, a whole spectrum of cognitive mechanisms that we investigate in human robot interaction. And then finally, a little bit more applied area, uh, robot assisted training for autism that I will not talk about uh, today during this very uh, short flash talk. And I will focus on the questions that I think are more uh, related and relevant for um, this audience and the topic of this conference. Um, all right, so intentional stance towards robots. This is one of the really main themes that we've been um, addressing. And the question is, whether and under what conditions people do adopt intentional stance towards uh, robots. So just a very quick introduction. I'm pretty sure that you're familiar with that concept, but the idea is that intentional stance is explaining and predicting the behaviors of others with reference to mental states. So if I see someone else uh, grasping for a glass of um, water, I explain their behavior that they want to drink because, and they believe that water will ease their thirst so wanting, believing, there's our mental state. On the other hand, we have design stance, uh, explaining predicting behaviors with reference to how this system was designed to behave. So you might already see that the rob robots might be somewhere in between. They are artifacts, so we should adopt the design stance, yet we are kind of tempted to adopt the intentional stance towards robots. And we in our lab are questioning when, um, or asking a question, um, actually, what are the conditions that people adopt the intentional stance towards robots? So first, we needed to operationalize. How do you actually measure that people adopted an intentional stance towards a robot? So this is a, a tool, a, ta a test that we have developed. So it's um, a set of scenarios. One scenario is just basically this triplet of pictures. You see there's a story evolving here in this, in this scenario. And we ask our participants um, to determine um, 
for each of the scenarios, whether one or the other description fits better to the scenario. And you see one description is actually using mentalistic terms. ICAP was trying to cheat or ICAP was unbalanced, very mechanistic response. So in this way, we can see whether people will be more likely to uh, use mentalistic vocabulary or mechanistic vocabulary. And we can quantify then the degree to which they adopted intentional stance by basically looking at this cursor and quantifying this um, uh, line here from let's say zero to 100. What we have observed is that on average, people usually uh, score around 42, between 40 and 45, which is um, something that is, um, if you think about me mechanistic being on the zero part and the intentional on the hundred um, side of the spectrum, then 40 is somewhere closer to the mechanistic, but not completely mechanistic. So people do adopt intentional stance to some extent. And then this we have replicated many, many times in various conditions online in the lab and so on and so forth. Um, but what the interesting part is that aside from just developing the tool and seeing what is like the kind of baseline intentional stance, we have also looked at neural activity and whether we can predict from the brain state, uh, neural state, what stance people will take towards robots. And in fact, we were able to predict from resting state EG activity. This is EG activity during uh, rest. So they just, our participants just came to the lab. They haven't yet um, done the task. They haven't seen the robot. Uh, and we just asked them to, you know, relax, sit there and relax, think of whatever you want to think. And then what we can do is actually look at the neural activity during that time uh, of resting state and um, map it to the responses they later give in the task. And what we see is that from neural activity in the beta range, you can actually classify people to those who are more on the intentional stance and those that are more on the mechanistic stance, which I think is quite an interesting um, result because you can see neural correlates of adopting intentional stance. Now, something maybe more interesting for, uh, for you here is whether we can up or down modulate the intentional stance through behavior of robot. And we were talking here earlier, we, we were <laughs> hearing some talks about um, emotional bonding and, and um, let's say more natural um, situation. What we um, ask our participants to do is to watch a movie with the robot ICAP. And the, the robot ICAP will display responses to the videos that are um, very much contingent on what happens in the video and they will be emotional uh, responses. So in this case, it will be uh, joy and uh, it will be giggling. I don't know if you hear the sound, but basically the robot is giggling and you cannot help it as a participant, but you actually giggle, giggle together with the robot. And that creates a, some sort of an emotional bonding, emotional or a social bonding between them because they're doing an activity together, they're responding in a similar way. And that actually increases quite substantially our intentional stance score. And uh, when you look at the score post interaction as compared to uh, before interaction, I'm running out of time, so I'm rushing through these slides very quickly, but just wanted to uh, tell you about um, topics that we're addressing with respect to moral responsibility, because of course the next question for us is what is the relationship between the intentional stance that people adopt towards the robot and attribution of moral responsibility. So um, Jim earlier talked about the relationship between intelligence and, and moral um, and morality. Here we have a very similar question about attribution of intentionality and um, attribution of morality. And um, one interesting thing that we see in some of our studies is that actually it's not so straightforward that people necessarily um, attribute intentionality and um, responsibility uh, in the same way. So they might actually attribute responsibility without attributing intentionality, which is quite an interesting aspect. And this um, has been what, what we have um, uh, looked into is these kind of uh, studies with using vignettes and uh, our character ICAB who does something and there's a side effect of their action. And we ask participants to uh, rate how much responsibility or intentionality ICAB um, uh, deserves for the outcome of the action. And then finally, last uh, topic, I'm really, really going very quickly through this, is about moral agency. And again, it's kind of related to responsibility. 
And uh, the question that we're asking is, um, what is the best strategy to, in, to induce, let's say, attribution of uh, moral agency to artificial agents, whether we should actually use explicit instructions about moral awareness of the system, or whether we should do it in an implicit way by robot behaviors, the same way as we did for the intentionality, um, intentional stance where the robot was just displaying certain behaviors that increased the um, adoption of intentional stance. And um, this is a very, very similar setup to the intentional st stance setup where we um, investigate attribution of moral agency. And with this, I would like to just uh, conclude that robots can actually be seen as intentional agents, even in, though genuinely they're not, and especially if their behavior seems to be uh, human-like. And does that also apply to moral agency? This is an open question we can have dura during the discussion. I would like to thank my team and especially those people who contributed to these questions and thank you for your attention. So I would love to chat afterwards. I, we're doing work on empathy choice for human and robot targets as we speak. And so I'm sure we would have much to, to converse about, but. Does anybody in the audience or online have time for one quick question? Yeah, Brett. Yeah, uh, thanks so much for that really interesting talk. Um, so I was wondering about the uh, sort of I don't know if you could say more a little about the systematicity or the 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 ways in which people over time commit because the, the the interesting thing about the intentional stance right is that you can adopt it towards anything right like you can adopt it towards a lectern and give an account of why the lectern thinks that it's in the center of the universe to take Dennett's example right so so you know the minimum bar of like we can take the intentional stance towards robots seems like yep great uh, we definitely can um, but is there some is there some sort of way of uh, measuring and thinking about how we take this, the intentional stance in a more systematic way that might be might differentiate the robot from the lectern or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for for this great question. Yes, I mean we have done experiments, of course, also where we uh, decreased uh, the adoption of intentional stance, so the, the decreased the, the baseline score, uh, where you show a behavior of a robot that is super mechanistic, and so we had control conditions for these experiments that I showed where the robot was just like calibrating motors and beeping and uh, showed completely mechanistic uh, behaviors that actually does not increase the intentional stance. Uh, we have also shown in other interactive scenarios where, again, the robot behaved in a mechanistic way that we decreased um, the adoption of intentional stance. And regarding all sorts of factors, I didn't have time to elaborate here today, but um, there are many, many factors that contribute uh, to adopting the intentional stance. So the robot behavior, robot appearance, of course, but also very much depends on the observer, so individual traits of people and um, the individual tendency to adopt intentional stance. And I could talk about this for another, you know, half an hour. So happy to discuss um, uh, all later on, maybe about about these aspects. Great, thank you very much. So we have uh, two speakers. Um, so we have Danica Dillian from UNC Chapel Hill, followed by Elio Dock from the University of Edinburgh and the Sentience Institute. I think for each speaker, we'll probably have time for about one question after their respective talks, and then we will have to, to break for lunch. Um, but, um, but yeah, why don't we switch to Ali, and then if you wanted to see on your end. Okay, cool. Well, hopefully my share screen will work. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, thank you so much for having me today. Um, so I'm going to present some findings on people's attributions of moral patiency in AIs from a, re a review article that I wrote with uh, my PhD supervisors, Matty Wilkes and Steve Lochnan. Um, and in this paper, we asked uh, whether people perceive AIs as moral patients, uh, which kinds of AIs are granted moral patiency, uh, what kinds of people treat AIs as moral patients, and how people feel about AI moral patients. And I'm going to particularly focus on the role of empathy and emotions on attributions of moral patiency in this talk. And note that I'm using the term AI broadly to mean any intelligent entity built by humans, like robots, chatbots, and self-driving cars. Okay, so first, what is moral patiency? Uh, moral patients are those entities that can be targets of right and wrong actions and so deserve moral concern. 
And typically we think of such entities as having experiential mental capacities, such as the capacity to feel physical pain or emotions. And moral patiency has been, uh, it has multiple dimensions and it's been measured in multiple ways in the literature. So for example, we tend to feel moral concern for moral patients. Uh, we include them in our moral circles. We think it's morally wrong to help them, uh, to harm them, sorry, and morally right to help them. Um, we're less likely to sacrifice them in moral dilemmas. Uh, we grant them moral rights and we feel moral emotions such as empathy uh, when we see them being harmed. And so why does it matter whether AIs are attributed moral patiency? Uh, well, I think it matters because AIs might in fact be moral patients, uh, in which case we'd need to treat them with moral concern. Uh, on the other hand, AIs might seem like moral patients but not actually be moral patients. Uh, so it would arguably be a waste of resources to grant them uh, moral patiency. Okay, so do people see AIs as moral patients? Uh, no, people uh, generally don't see current AIs as moral patients. Uh, they think they have experiential capacities, such as fear and pain, uh, comparable to a dead person. And they're placed at the outskirts of people's moral circles, uh, further from the middle than chickens, apple trees, and murderers. Uh, but people do feel moral emotions for AIs, uh, so in one study, uh, people felt sorry for AIs being harmed in film clips. And in another, they felt personal distress, uh, a type of empathy uh, in response to seeing a robot being abused. And people also uh, think future AIs can somewhat have emotions. And they think it can be in principle uh, wrong to harm an artificial being. Uh, so future AIs uh, will plausibly be seen as moral patients. Okay, what kinds of AIs are seen as moral patients? Uh, so most importantly, the literature, literature suggests that AIs that are perceived to have the capacity for experience will be granted moral patiency. So for example, in one study, robots described as having a greater capacity for experience and emotions were less likely to be sacrificed in moral dilemmas. Uh, in one of my studies, prosocial capacities more generally, such as emotion expression and emotion recognition uh, and cooperation, which seem closely related to empathy, uh, were strongly predictive of moral patiency attributions to AIs. Uh, so yeah, AIs with the capacity for uh, experiencing emotions and also uh, able to act pro-socially are more likely to be seen as moral patients. Okay, what kinds of people see AIs as moral patients? Uh, Paul Katat and Anthes tested a wide range of predictors and most importantly for this conference, uh, they found that feeling positive emotions for AIs, uh, in particular, respect, admiration, compassion, or an excitement, uh, strongly positively predicted attributions of moral patiency to AIs. And in one of my studies uh, in which we encouraged participants to take the perspective of an AI, uh, we found that those that reported higher empathic concern for the AI also had uh, more moral concern uh, for AIs as a group. So yeah, feeling positive emotions, uh, including empathy for AIs uh, is more it is associated uh, with granting AIs more moral patiency. Okay, how do people feel about AI moral patients? So while they grant them more moral patiency, uh, there's evidence that people are uncomfortable with um, AIs that have experien experiential or emotional capacities. So for example, Gray and Wegner found that the uncanny valley, uh, the creepy feeling that uh, people sometimes report when interacting with human-like robots, uh, is explained by perceiving experience or emotion in AIs. And in another study, uh, stripping robots of their capacity for feeling emotions and having experience uh, more generally uh, reduced uh, discomfort. Uh, but yeah, this would uh, likely also reduce attributions of moral patiency, uh, which may be an unwanted effect. Okay, so some takeaways. Uh, people don't see uh, current AIs as moral patients, but they do feel moral emotions, such as empathy for them. Uh, people think future AIs could have emotions and could be moral patients. Uh, people who feel more empathy and other positive emotions for AIs are more likely to grant AIs moral patiency. Uh, AIs perceived as having uh, more emotions and experience and also prosociality in general are more likely to be granted moral patiency. Uh, but then there's also uh, evidence that people are uncomfortable uh, with such AIs. 
So while there's lots of reasons to think that uh, empathy and emotion will be positively associated with attributions of moral patience in AIs, uh, there are also some risk of, uh, risks of negative effects for AIs due to the discomfort uh, that it causes. And so an important future uh, topic of future research is to try and better understand and disentangle uh, these positive and negative effects of emotions uh, in AIs on, on their perception and treatment. Thank you. All right, uh, time for one question. Uh, yeah, Gus. Yeah, thanks for the talk and, and for sharing the paper over email. I, I read it before I came because I was just so interested. Um, and so I'm just curious, like it, it's a review paper, um, but when you're talking about moral patiency in the paper and then in the talk today, like are you, do you have in mind the kind of like Kurt Gray moral typecasting sort of view where, where patiency is just the inverse of agency such that being a patient necessarily makes one less of an agent and you know, being an agent necessarily makes one less of a patient? Yeah, um, I'm not sure what I make of it like empirically, but um, in 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 theory, I think you can be both a moral patient and a moral agent, and I'm kind of uh, thinking of it in in that way. Um, so yeah, I think like uh, an adult human is a moral patient; uh, they deserve moral concern, um, and also they're moral agents. Um, uh, yeah we should be held morally responsible for our actions in, in most cases. Um, yeah. Um, so the way I'm thinking of it, you you can be attributed both and AIs could be attributed both. Um, I'm not sure what I make empirically. Um, I think, yeah, there's some evidence that they're inverse. Um, but I don't, I, I'm not sure that, um, yeah, I'm not sure that it's like, completely obvious the case that you know you can only be one or the other it seems to me you can you can you can probably be both great well thank you very much so we have one last speaker all right well hi everyone sorry for the delay i'm dana cadillion i'm a grad student at unc and i'm going to be sharing some of our work looking at the moral alignment of large language models so over the past couple of years, we've seen the rise of large language models like ChatGPT in many areas of our lives. Um, next. And um, like we've talked about today, a lot of these domains are really deeply human. People are turning to ChatGPT for legal advice, to give them therapy, for romantic companionship, and even in some isolated cases for religious services. Next. And these domains, they're not only deeply human, they're also deeply moral. So more and more we're seeing AI involved in moral decision-making. But we know very little about how good LLMs are at understanding and predicting people's moral preferences. Next. So that was the main driving force of our research is how well can LLMs model morality? Um, next. And at the time uh, when we began this research, um, last March, older models could somewhat predict binary moral ratings, um, but there hadn't really been any work looking at how well they could pinpoint uh, how moral something is in relation to each other. And so um, next, we thought that new models might be able to do even better at the time when ChatGBT had just been released. Next. So in our first study, we followed a fairly simple procedure. We found um, five published papers that had public data sets available with average ratings from US participants of how moral different scenarios were. And these scenarios included things like um, yelling at a server, uh, stealing a parking space, saving someone from being hit by a car, things that varied both in intensity and valence. And then we asked GPT 3.5 to rate these scenarios on the same continuous scale that participants had in order to see could, um, could current language models really pinpoint how moral is something in relation to another thing. And then we just analyzed how well GBT's judgments corresponded with average participant judgments. And next. Um, so we thought GBT might do really good at this. After all, in order to be able to write convincingly enough like a person, you have to have some semblance of moral understanding but we were honestly really surprised at just how well it did. Um, 
the next you can see the graph. So uh, we found a 0.95 correlation between GPTs and US participants' moral judgments, which is much higher than I'm used to seeing in my own work for really anything. Um, we were kind of amazed because for so long, people have doubted that machines could ever really understand the nuances of morality, or at least model them. Um, an important caveat, though, to this work is that these studies were conducted in the US. GBT is also disproportionately trained on data from the US. And so in that sense, it's less surprising that it was able to do well at this particular task. But um, overall, next, um, this suggests that language models can model moral judgments from their extensive sets of training data, that rather than having to give them this explicit set of moral rules, that they can kind of pick up implicitly on these billions of examples of text and in the moral information that is embedded in them. Um, next. So, you know, there were a few different directions we could take this research next. One follow-up question we had is that even though it seemed like language models were doing pretty good at um, moral judgments, that they're still largely a black box. And it's hard for people if you're interacting with a platform like ChatGBT to really be able to like quote unquote check the work of language models and see where are their judgments coming from, what criteria are they using. So next we wanted to see whether language models can pick up on similar criteria for whether something is moral or not as people. So next. So we follow the same basic procedure as in study one. Um, we edited 174 of the scenarios from study one to vary in different indicators that have been shown to be important for moral judgments, like how much harm was caused, how intentional the action was, and how vulnerable the people affected were. So for example, these included scenarios like person X participated in an effort to clean up a city park and person X littered in a city park. Next. Um, so just as a sanity check, we replicated the moral alignment findings with a 0.92 correlation between GPT and average participants in our study. Um, and this was, you know, with half of the scenarios being new, GPT couldn't have seen them before. Next. And in this study, we didn't find any significant differences in moral alignment based on participants' ethnicity or gender. This could partly, you know, this could be because we didn't find a lot of differences um, in general, based on the gender or ethnicity and moral judgment ratings for these particular scenarios. Next. And so next we um, wanted to see whether GPT could align with people on these moral criteria, whether it based moral decisions on um, how harmful, vulnerable, and intentional the action was in a similar way that people did. Next. So we found that both participants in GBT, um, the more harmful an action was, the less moral it was seen as, with fairly common uh, relationships between these variables for the two. Next. Um, and we found that, again, among both participants in GBT, there was an interaction where if the patient was very vulnerable um, and the action was harmful, then the more vulnerable they were, the less moral the action was. Um, and it didn't matter so much if the action was helpful. Um, next. And we found a similar interaction um, for um, not just the vulnerability, but also the intentionality, like how, how much they try to do this on purpose. I'm sorry if you can hear my dog in the background. Um, <laughs> I'll be on I'll be just a second. Um, so the important thing here being that both participants in GPT, they tended to align in how these indicators mattered for moral judgments. Next. Um, this suggests that language models can also pick up on moral criteria from their training data, which could be useful when thinking about ways to kind of have models uh, show, show their quote unquote intuitions about things so people can see how much they agree on their moral judgments based on the criteria that they have in common or don't. Uh, next. So um, there's some implications from this work that LLMs appear capable of high moral alignment with people, at least, um, you know, based on these kind of uh, shorter scenarios. Next. And they also appear um, capable of using similar moral criteria as people. Next. Um, there's a really important future work, though, to be done. Next. Um, one is that uh, current language models are disproportionately trained on data from Western populations. And because of this, their moral judgments tend to be biased towards Western English speakers. So it's important. Um, that we build models that use more representative data going forward um, and fine tune existing models. Next. And then, you know, a lot of the work today has um, 
really dive into this, but also doing more naturalistic tests on a lot of these really impactful use cases to see how language models are affecting people in these important domains. Um, and last slide. Okay, thank you so much um, to my collaborators, to UNC and the Allen Institute for AI. Um, thank you, Daryl, so much for troubleshooting with me on this presentation, and thank you all for your attention. Okay, so uh, again, time for one question. And again, anybody who has questions should feel free to stick around for the, the Q&A 3 or email any of the authors. Either online, you can always drop a question in the Q&A function there on Zoom or here in person. Yeah, Alan? Um, I'll just speak up, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so given the moral system around So I don't know, could you hear the question? Whether we would consider re um, replacing participants with AI models? Yes. For different psychological studies? Yeah, that was actually, so in uh, this paper where we presented these moral findings, that was um, kind of one of the big questions that we were exploring because we were so surprised that something as nuanced as morality could be picked up on by large language models with that high of a correlation. Um, I think in a lot of cases, yes, at least for pilot studies, especially, you know, if you're, um, if you're kind of pressed for cash and trying to see if something will work and you're, especially if you're interested in, um, uh, the given population that language models are, um, like able to represent. So, so in this case, I'd say globally, no language models aren't there yet, but eventually, with more representative data, they could be. Um, if you're looking at participants in the US, for example, for running pilot studies, um, and maybe like one out of um, a group of 10 studies could be replicated on language models. I don't think they could ever fully replace participants, but I think they could definitely supplement participants in the psychological studies. Um, and that since that paper came out, there's been a lot of work finding that they can also um, approximate people's ratings in a lot of domains. Um, and so I think there's more work to be done to see like what are what are the limitations there and are there certain domains um, that language models have a lot of trouble picking up on. Um, but you know maybe in 10 years or so we'll see that being more common practice. And to close the panel, we do have one anonymous attendee who asked a question. I think it'd be interesting for all five of you, if any of you want to jump in, as we await what seems like the food to arrive. Um, to what extent do you see humans leaning on AI for moral guidance? So anybody feel free to jump in. Big question. Uh, I think it's quite possible they will begin to do that. I think it's very worrying that they might begin to do that. Um, I, I think there are a lot of concerns with this idea of artificial moral advisors and um, uh, Yushin Liu at Edinburgh University has, has written a very good paper with, I think, Adam Morris and Shannon Valor talking about artificial moral advisors and sort of some of the philosophical and psychological concerns with that, both how we build them, but also some sort of meta concerns about in what context or circumstances might we begin to even approach an artificial agent for advice? Um, and what sort of commitment devices might there be to ensure that we act on it rather than just sort of a, a game that we play almost? Um, there's some, they, they raise some many interesting points following on from some earlier work on these artificial moral advisors um, by Savalescu and Gablini and colleagues. And I think it's a very interesting thing to think about. And it also fills me with quite a lot of dread as one of the uh, the tech doomers here in the in the audience, I guess. Any other thoughts from the panel? All right. Um, well, I, I can just yeah, maybe say something very, but it is it is not uh, well researched like Jim's answer. Um, I from personal experience, I'll just say, I think humans are using the internet to ask questions like, what should I do with, you know, um, in this situation or, and maybe they're replacing the internet with AI. But of course, the big issue is now there is no responsibility for the 
the answer, right? Um, is this it, now when I go back to, oh gosh, I, I lent on the a quote unquote AI for this um, answer, um, who's responsible? And we don't have, you know, that in place at this time. Well, great. Well, thank you all very much for your fascinating talks. Um, anybody who has questions, again, please hold on to them and we'll come back a little bit later.